Well, again, good morning. morning. Glad you come out and be with us here this morning. Lost my pen. No worries. I found it. You guys can all relax and stop looking. I guess it was all looking diligently, weren't you? If you have your Bibles with you, you may open them up and begin finding. I'm not going to tell you the book, but I'm simply going to tell you it is probably my favorite book in the Bible, and we'll see how many people can find it. You should be able to, because I know I've said it multiple times, but I'll tell you specifically here in a moment. Just let you sit on the edge of your seat for a minute. At least, you know, move your thumbs a little bit and act like you're looking. Humor me a little bit if you don't mind. Letter. It has letters in it, yes, and there is one in the beginning. Um, you find lots of wisdom in this here book. It's the only clue I give you. So, last weekend, Mandy and I, uh, we took like a mental health day, and uh, we went uh, up to the mountains on Friday and spent Saturday up there. That is completely irrelevant to you. But what I want you to note is while we was up there, from the time we got off 40 um, and drove to where we stayed, I am pretty sure that every single business had a help on its sign. Every single one. Like that, however many miles it was from 40 uh, to where we stayed, everyone had a help wanted sign. You probably really don't care about that either. But that is important. And that is important because people desire you to work. They desire you to, uh, um, to do things, if you will. Whether it's, uh, you know, a, a, a grand job that you do uh, magnificent things or whether you simply get the, the fries out of the grease and put salt on them, every job is equally important and a society uh, needs you to participate in them. Now, uh, while we was there, we was eating breakfast at the Cracker Barrel and this manager lady was talking and uh, the guy that was talking to him was like, you know, I thought you guys had, uh, uh, had lifted some of the seating restrictions where you could open the restaurant up a little bit uh, bigger uh, and, and put more people in here. She said, well, it wouldn't matter if we could. She said, we don't have the staff to open up any more than what we are. We can barely keep up with what we have. None of that, again, is really important to you this morning, but I need you to at least be hearing these things because we're going to come back to it. Um, there, you know, when you can't have enough people to work just to simply run your normal day-to-day -day business or your operations, you're getting in a uh, you're getting in a predicament. Now. Uh, In Bible times, when you look at standards in society, that's the way we'll phrase that, and you're, I guess, where we have, you know, what you want to call, you know, truly poor, you have, kind of have lower middle class, middle middle class, upper middle class, and then the upper echelon of society that's about the way we rank things these days and people kind of you can fluctuate in there uh, however it is that you go but in Bible times you was either rich or you was poor there wasn't really middle class and when I say rich um, the only people that was truly wealthy were of royalty so that was a very small number most people were what we would consider you know the uh, poor folks but a lot of times, especially in, in Bible times, when you see the word poor, it is not that they didn't have much because nobody had much. It was just the way it was. Poor oftentimes is referred to another word that we have in our language called lazy, or poor would be those that just don't work, those that won't work. Because in these days and in these times, especially Bible times, there wasn't... Um, 
you didn't have government assistant programs. You either had or you had not. You, you did or you did not. There wasn't really things in between. And again, that is not extremely important to you right now, but as we go through some of these words and some of these phrases, I want you to understand that we're not talking about just those that are poor and don't have much money. What we are speaking to and what is an example of are those that refuse to work, those that would refuse to, to uh, uh, attempt, if you will. Now, you should be, in the book of Proverbs, is where you should be. How many people, by show of hands, got it right? Very nice. Proud of you guys. Did you know it before I said there was a lot of wisdom in that book? But you, at least you got that hint, though. Good job, MD. You pass. You get an A today. Jamie, just because you had that big grin, you fail. <laughs> Pride was welling up in your heart, and we must take you down a notch. That's what was happening. Hey, we got a revival coming up next week. Do you guys know that? In the meantime, while you're ignoring me while I'm preaching, I want you to do something else, okay? I need you to be thinking about what you expect from the preacher, okay? You hold that in the back of your mind. We'll revisit that later. But I need you to be thinking of what you expect. In the 14th chapter of the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter number 14, and I'm going to begin reading just a few verses here at verse number 20. In Proverbs 14, 20, the Bible says this, The poor is hated even of his own neighbor, but the rich hath many friends. He that despiseth his neighbor sinneth, but he that hath mercy on the poor happy is he. Do they not err that devise evil? But mercy and truth shall be to them that devise good. In all labor there is profit, but the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. The crown of the wise is their riches, but the foolishness of fools is folly. A true witness, underline this, a true witness delivereth souls. But a deceitful witness speaketh lies. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord. So we come before you again here this morning, God, we're thankful to be in your house, Father. We're thankful, Lord, just to, uh, to be able to come in, Father, freely, Father, to fellowship with our brothers and sisters, Lord, just to be able to, uh, to, to laugh and to smile, Father, just to, uh, to be able to greet one another, Father. But most importantly, Lord, we are thankful, God, that we can come in, Father, that we can read of your word, Lord, that we can learn of you, Father, we can learn uh, more and more of your expectations for us, God. We just uh, pray, Lord, that you would take this time and this opportunity here this morning, God, to speak to our hearts, Lord, just to allow us to, uh, to be truly attentive unto you this morning, Father, just to, uh, to, to, to treat you with the respect, Lord, that you so deserve, Father, to uh, just to listen, Lord, to what you speak in our hearts, Father, Lord, not what it is that I say, uh, Father, the things that, uh, that others would say, but Lord, truly what you speak in our hearts through the reading of your word, through hearing and studying it, Father, we just ask you, Lord, that you'd allow your spirit, Lord, just to come into this house, Lord, just to move freely in amongst us, Lord, to speak into us, Lord, just to help us to uplift this father to uh to grow us father we just pray lord that you would have your way with us here this day father and i ask these things in your son christ jesus name and amen i want you to understand a couple things as we go right into this one i want us to understand that what uh, solomon is writing and what he's speaking to his boys here uh, again when you look at the word poor it's not necessarily those that doesn't uh have money or doesn't have wealth doesn't have things but those that uh, are just truly refusing uh, to put their hand to the plow if you will and to go to work to begin to do things uh, it says the poor is hated even of his own neighbor now i want you to think of this and this is something this is not uh, uh this this is an opinion that Solomon is giving and it is a, an opinion that he has viewed just by living life. It is something that we can see and that we can understand uh, by our own lives in which we have lived that there are times that when you take just the truly lazy individuals, we don't think too highly of them. 
Now, take your mind from being this big, and I want you to get it about this big. I don't want you to think about those that may be uh, driving Mercedes and living off the government. That's not where I want your mind to go. We're talking about Oakdale Baptist Church and Oakdale Baptist Church only this morning. When we begin thinking of the, uh, the even in the church house where the brothers should be loving one another, should be uh, uh, growing one another, should truly be helping one another in things, when we get lazy, we will immediately begin to have not pleasant feelings for those around us. Not a person here is going to nod their head and say amen, but you know what I'm talking about. When there's work to be done, hey, I'm not saying because we're having a work day in a few weeks, I'm not trying to guilt you into coming. I'm simply trying to give you what God has given me this morning. But when there are, or whether it be like some types of natural disasters, or whether you just know that the, uh, the, the ceiling fans need wiped off, or there's a, a light bulbs that are shot, whatever it may be, when we just sit and refuse to put our hand forward to do anything, we can begin to get ill feelings toward others. Amen. We've said this so many times before that, you know, a lot of times in churches you have the doers and those that are content to let them do and then those that will say, well, they always do it and I would help if it wasn't for them. G3 groups. Every church has them. We are not any different than any other church. But when reading and beginning to see that the poor is hated even of his own neighbor, even by those that come to church and worship together. I don't mean to make you feel good or bad really in either way this morning, but I, I want you to understand that we that can begin, and I'm going to say we because I'm included in this, uh, in this whole realm of things here, when you begin to, uh, to, 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 to snarl your lips, snarl your nose, and to uh, begin to have those ill feelings because, well, you know, I just wish so-and-so would help. I wish they would do something. I wish, I wish it was this. I wish it was that. I wish I wasn't the one that had to do that. It's not pleasing unto God. Amen. Read. The poor is hated even his own neighbor, but the rich has many friends. You know what? Uh, uh, we may get back to that. But 21 says this, He that despiseth his neighbor sinneth. Feel that if you want to, my friend, that's sin. That hatred towards your brother, that ill will that you have, that uh, uh, feelings of... Uh, uh, um, I've heard it said this way before, that a bicycle wheel's got many spokes inside of it. And I've heard it said that if you cut a few of them out, that wheel will still turn just fine. That is a sorry attitude for you to have, Christian. That is a sorry attitude for you to have. You shouldn't want to cut not one of those spokes out because when in reference to those spokes, that's your brothers and sisters. Those are the ones that come and worship with you. Those are those that come and praise God with you, that meet with you within the walls of this house on a weekly basis. It is those that you are content with saying, well, we don't really need them. How dare you? What gives you and I the right to say or to feel those things? Well, preacher, I can say it because I do this. Really, why do you do that? If you're doing it for any other reason other than for God to get the glory, then stop because you're doing it for the wrong reasons. Maybe those that can't do, you know what they might be really great at? I mean, they might be some of the best prayer warriors within the walls of the church house. You know that thing that we're not too good at, that we don't always spend time in prayer. We don't spend apple time in there. We don't go off into our closet or into a private place to be able to have a true conversation with God. Maybe it's those that can do that really well. 
You want to take all your prayers out of the church? What then? Because you might need them. Because sometimes we get too busy doing all this work for vain glory that we forget to pray. Amen. It happens. And it can happen to any of us. Because pride is one of those things that, by George, it'll creep up. Before you know it, you'll begin to think that we're something. The devil will make you think that you are the most valuable member of the church house. You mean the devil wants me to think that? Yeah, because if he can fill your heart with pride, you're going to be useless to God. Yeah, go to church. Oh, you need to go to church. Church can't make it without you. You mean the devil would, would encourage me to go? Yeah, if he can fill your heart with pride and he can just stick the knife in and just twist it little by little. Yeah, sure would. Stay rooted. Know where you're at, church. He that despiseth his neighbor sinneth, but he that hath mercy on the poor, happy is he. What is mercy? That's, you know, we've talked about that so much the last few weeks. That's that thing that God gives you and I that we didn't deserve. Amen? Nod your head. Say amen because you didn't deserve the mercy that God's given you. But what does the Bible say? He that hath mercy on the poor, happy is he. Mercy, you could, uh, uh, what is that word that we could say? Unmerited favor. That's a, that's a definition that you can find when it comes to mercy. Unmerited favor. Uh, something that is undeserved. Something that uh, is given, uh, I guess, with, uh, you could say, without cause, so to speak. But do they not err that devise evil? Because what does it say? He that despises his neighbor sinneth. Do they not err that devise evil? But mercy and truth shall be to them that devise good. Churches can be very complicated places. Do you know why? Because there's people in them. God's not a bit complicated. Do you know that? God is as simple as he can be. He has set forth his expectations, his standards, uh, uh, his, his character, the things that he has 100% said, I will do, and the things that he has said, I will not do. There is no complicatedness, things that you can find in there when it comes to God and churches, but what complicates them is us. Well, we can't say, we can't hold them to this standard because, well, these reasons, but now this person over here, now we can do that to them because uh, they're of this. God is not a respecter of persons. But we are. The Bible says this right here. It says, in all labor there is profit. Jesus had also said, come unto me, all you that are... Uh, that, that are well, I'm going to have to flip over there because my mind has just went blank. If you want to turn over to Matthew, you can find it over there. It says, uh, uh, Jesus is telling that you can come unto him and he's going to give you rest if you have labored. Those that will be weary from labor. Those that have really uh, 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 been diligent in what they were doing that has, uh, has uh, uh, what we would say has really tried. Not just those who have showed up and... Uh, like... Bubba's retired, so we can say the state workers. You know what I'm talking about? You drive down the road, and you got four of them holding up one shovel and one person in a ditch using another shovel, right? It's the best example I can show you of a church. Because that's at some point the way every person in here feels. Sometimes you're in the ditch, sometimes you're holding up the shovel. But in all labor... There is profit, and Christ will give you rest. But you read on down from where we're at, and he's talking about just how talking about it. Man, there's people that wear themselves out talking about the work that they need to do. And they've talked about everything that they need to do. They've got so tired, they must go take a nap. They need to sit down and rest a while. Boy, I, I have laid out everything that we need to do. I'm worn out. Uh, we, we need to go rest. 
We, we nobody, nobody started sweating yet. And ain't nobody got no blisters on their hands. In all labor there is profit. I want, let's bring her down. Let's get small here so we can understand this. If Christ had only talked about coming and Christ had only talked about miracles and had only talked about going to the cross and had never done any of it, where would we be? We'd still be lost and we'd still be in need of a Savior. Because just talking about it, it helps us understand. It helps us uh, get the uh, uh, grasp of what's going on. We're able to see the big picture, if you will. But just merely talking about it is not benefiting anyone if no one's willing to go forth and do the work. But in the Bible also says this, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh, but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late and to eat bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. I want us to understand that if God is not in what we're doing, that labor is not really profitable. Just running in circles. Like a dog trying to catch his tail. Or a dog trying to catch a car. He's going to catch it one of these days and what's he going to do with it? I want us to grasp what we're talking about. I mean, again, we're not talking about those that uh, don't have much money. We're talking about those that just really refuse to work. You remember how we talked about all the businesses along the, the, the strip up through Pigeon Forge and places like that, that they need people to work? The society uh, d d demands that. You need to go to the grocery store and buy your groceries. Well, you need someone there to sell them to you. And maybe that person's willing to be there, but if the farmer's not willing to grow the crop, guess what you can't buy? You are dependent upon someone else doing the work. We may be the ones reaping the benefits, but you need somebody willing to work. And Jesus says that the fields are white with harvest, but the labors, they're few and far between. And it was that way in Jesus' day. So you see where we are now. You remember a few weeks ago when we started the service and we said, if only the people you invited were here today, how many people would be here? If I ask you that each week, would the answer still be less than five? In all labor, there is profit. God needs people that are willing to work. In all labor there's profit, but the talk of the lips is useless. The crown of the wise is their riches, but the foolishness of fools is folly. And it says here in verse number 25, it says, A true witness should be you and I. I told you to underline this. A true witness, the Bible says, delivereth souls. Does that mean that you need to be keeping a logbook of all the people that you've led to Christ? No. Because then we're going to come back into pride. What we are talking about is that a true witness produces fruits. A true witness, you ought to be able to... You understand your value to God. Let me just slow this way down for just a moment. You may think to yourself in, a, in, a, in the grand scheme of society or in a group of people that you're useless and that you don't matter. Stop thinking that way because you are extremely valuable to God Almighty. You are so valuable that He sent His only beloved Son to purchase you for Himself. That's how valuable you are. That he sent Christ Jesus to die the gruesome death on the cross for you. That's how valuable you are. 
And the same people that we think are uh, uh, quote unquote useless, Jesus died for them too. The same death that he died for you. You get into talking about how uh, uh, the, the Spirit distributes the, 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 the gifts abroad. And, you know, there are some preachers, there are some teachers, there are some uh, uh, of this, there are some of that. Each one of us have our own unique abilities. Use them. If everybody just quit working on cars, you know what? Eventually you can't go nowhere. You may have a great car for now, but eventually it's going to tear up. It's mechanical. It's going to happen. And if nobody's willing to work on it, eventually you're going to be stranded. Church, don't be that car. Church, be the mechanic. Be willing to fix them. Be willing to work on them. Be willing to keep people moving about. Because in all labor, there is profit. God needs you. God needs you to do the work. God needs you to go. He said go. He said go and tell. That's what he needs you and I to do. That is work. The Bible also says that whatsoever we do, we do wholeheartedly. That we do those things diligently. The Bible goes on to say that if uh, we have put our hand to the plow, we are not of any use if we're looking back on the things we have left behind. These are all things that the Bible speaks to about working. You can also go back into Genesis and you can find that what we have, we're going to earn by the sweat of our brow. We are not entitled to sit on our blessed assurance, church. God needs you to work. He needs us to get up and to go. Preacher, I can't get up and go no more. My get up and go done got up and went. You are still valuable to the kingdom of God, I assure you. That's where we have to be able and willing to change what we do. You may not be able to get in and do what you used to, but you're still a valuable part. And we need to look on each person as a valuable part. A true witness delivers souls. But a deceitful witness speaketh lies. Who are you deceiving? And who are you lying to? I don't think any person here would go out and lie to the lost and intentionally lead them down a path that leads them to hell. But you want me to tell you what I've done? I lie to the Christians. I lie to my brothers and sisters I go to church with to make them at least think I'm doing something. I will try to deceive them to make them think that I'm not lazy, to make them think that I'm useful. I'll lie to them. Because we don't want to we don't, I don't want to let you know that I'm letting you down. And if I am going to let you know, I'm at least going to make it sound really good as to why. A true witness delivers souls, but a deceitful witness speaketh lies. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. We know who God is. Amen? Amen? We understand who our Savior is. We understand who sent Him. We understand the plan that God has. We understand that, uh, that, that without uh, um, us going forth and being the light, that the darkness is going to prevail. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure these things out. Be confident in what you're doing. Don't run around like, well, uh, oh, I need to do this, but I don't know how. You're right, you don't. Rely on the spirit that God has given you. Amen. Guys, I'm not giving you anything new. I'm not being mean. I'm not, I, I, I'm not gouging. I'm not doing any of those things. I am trying to build me. And you get the benefit of listening about it. This ain't to you. This is to me. I'm trying to help me. 
You know, God gives me these things. All these things get, comes to me first. I've said this so many times. You guys get the watered down version of it. I got the full dose. We have to be willing to do God's work. If you're not willing to do God's work, who is? Somebody go back there and open the back door and see how many people standing in line. It's glass and I can see through it. There ain't nobody out there. If you ain't willing to do it, who is? If we're not willing to spread the gospel, who's going to? What do you expect of your evangelist that comes next week? I want participation. I need you to say words to me. No doubt you have thought of revival coming up. What do you expect to come from revival? Somebody. Soul saved. We expect to see souls saved. Somebody else. What do you expect from the preacher? Somebody. You expect him to show up and preach. Bonita, you passed the class for talking today. Anybody else? What do you expect of Brother Dwight Kaufman when he walks in the church house doors next Sunday night? What do you expect? Got all day. You expect to see Christians get right with God. What else? Preach. What else? Church, we can, we can do this really simple. You expect him to bring one of these, don't you? You expect to get revived. That's what revival is for. What else? What about the singers? What do you expect from them? I have nowhere to be this evening. I can be here as long as you just want to sit there and look at me. What do you expect from the singers? Okay. Expect them to be, you could, you could say obedient. Jamie, what do you expect from the singers? Pretty simple, right? Matt, do you expect them to be able to sing? Make it more pleasant, wouldn't it? Trish, and you expect them to be at least, you know, like we said, musically inclined. You probably don't expect it to be their first time ever stepping out and doing that, do you? You expect them to be experienced, don't you? What about the preacher? Do you, you, again, we expect him to be able to pray, don't we? We expect him to have at least had a conversation with the Lord God Almighty prior to showing up next Sunday. We expect him to have read the Word of God. We expect him to have studied about what God wants him to preach about. What do you think his expectations are? He expects to pray. expects to be here. What else? Invite others? What about the singers? What do you think they expect of you and I? Pay attention, listen. Smile at them. Expect them to make them feel welcome. What about the preacher? Let's go back to him. This is important. I'm going to make a point here in a minute. We have these expectations of him. Whether we say it or not, we expect him to appear in a certain way. We don't expect him to come in with his turkey hunting clothes on. We don't expect him to come in wearing his muddy muck boots because he'd been out feeding the calves. We expect him to appear in a certain manner. We expect him to conduct himself in a certain manner. We expect him to be on time. We expect him to be obedient. Preacher, you're boring me. You're dragging this out. Get on with it. Nope, not yet. Stay with me. I need you. I need you to stay with me for a minute. Of all the things that we expect him to do. Of 
I'm going to read you something real quick. The Bible says this. It says, But watch thou in all things, and do afflictions, and to do the work of an evangelist. Every person here had expectations for Brother Dwight Kaufman next week. Those are the same expected expectations you should have for you. It is the exact same expectations that God has for you. Let me read it to you again. Plain letters, plain spoken. Do the work of an evangelist. Preacher, I don't know what an evangelist does. Don't you sit there and lie to me. You just told me what you expect. You told me what you expect. You heard it out loud. So not only did you hear your opinion, but you heard somebody else's. Do it. Because in all labor there is profit. And just merely talking about it, it's not benefiting anybody. The Bible doesn't, do, doesn't say think about the work of an evangelist. It says do the work of an evangelist. To do those things. And right below it, it says make full proof your ministry. So it says right there in making proof of, don't just talk about it. Do it. Do it. We expect the preacher to show up and preach. The preacher expects someone to be sitting in the pews. The, pe the, the preacher expects people to listen. They expect a response. They expect the Spirit of God to work and to move. These are all expectations that we all have when we come into church. The person you see in the mirror is not exempt from those expectations. If you ain't going to, you may be the only person that will bring it in. You have to. Don't you count on me to. Don't you count on the preacher's wife. Don't count on the deacons. You count on you. You bring your A game to church every Sunday. Something needs done. Don't count on someone else to do it when somebody needs prayed for don't count on someone else to do it you do it do the work because we know how we feel about those that refuse just up above where it says that the Bible says this preach the word be instant in season out of season reprove rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine that's our job, church. That's for you and I. Let's stand together here this morning.